ठीक है मगर आवाज जो है السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ آئی ایم ہیپی ٹو ویلکم یو آل ٹو دس سیشن افٹر حج اینڈ وائی وائی لائی واز ایٹ حج آئی میڈ دعا ٹو اللہ تعالی دیٹ نا آئی ایم 67 ایئرز اولڈ مے بی دیر از ناٹ مچ ٹائم لیفٹ useful time in my life so how should i spend it because allah taala wants allazi khalaqa almauta wal hayata liyabluwakum ayyukum ahsanu amala allah taala doesn't want to see average performance he want to see the best that we can do so i wanted to know what is the best i can do how is the what is the the maximum that i can do in order to help the umma out of its current difficulties so alhamdulillah allah taala put many ideas into my head and heart and i will be sharing some of them with you today and uh, some others i have already started to work on so let me start the presentation Oh, so I have to select that. All right, so I'm going to share the screen. <coughs> okay, so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So today I'm going to talk about the complete and perfect guidance from God. So some preliminaries, some uh, 1450 years ago, Allah Ta'ala revealed the Quran to our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. and this message changes the course of his human history and if you want to understand because this is actually something that is not taught in our schools and it needs to be taught what was the condition of the world before the coming of our prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and what was the condition after he left what was the effect of this message <clears throat> so there is a very important uh lesson that this message was very powerful the final message of allah taala to mankind change the course of history so <clears throat> just from this simple fact uh it leads to many questions what was this knowledge which created this revolution this question arises because today muslims around the globe are once again ignorant and backwards so how is it that they have this powerful and revolutionary message and yet they are still ignorant and backwards and then the question is does this knowledge which allah taala gave to man allam al insana ma lam yalam does it still have the same revolutionary power which it did 14 centuries ago well obviously anybody who is a muslim and a believer will say that yes the quran is complete and perfect and it cannot change so but then this leads to another question <clears throat> if this knowledge has this power then 
how come the Muslims are not using it to change their current condition? <clears throat> so, to make this a little bit more concrete, the Islamic civilization led the world in the production of knowledge for more than a thousand years. And this is also the period which is called the Dark Ages of Europe, where there was no knowledge in Europe. So why did the Islamic uh, civilization lead the world in knowledge? Because Allah Ta'ala has given us a unique message, unlike any other. And it starts by <coughs> the word Iqra, and it mentions Alam al insana Alam Ya'alam, and it uh, it challenges us human beings to search for knowledge. Allah Ta'ala describes how Allah Ta'ala taught Adam alayhi salam the names and then he made the angels make sajda. So it was in the honor of the knowledge given to Adam alayhi salam that he was uh, made sajda to. But today if we look around us the situation seems reversed uh, the so-called enlightenment of Europe ended the dark ages of Europe and led to the production of massive amounts of knowledge. And around the same time, the Islamic civilization uh, went into our own dark ages in which we are filled with ignorance and superstition all around the globe. And this is contrary to what Allah Ta'ala says, that Allah Ta'ala will lead the believers out of darkness into light, and he will lead those who disbelieve out of light into darkness. So this situation for the last few centuries seems like it is in conflict with the Quran. So for the Muslim leadership, and actually Allah Ta'ala has made all of us leaders of the Ummah. He has given us all individually responsibility. Every single person, Allah Ta'ala says, is more valuable than the entire planet full of lives. So every single Muslim is very important. So we have to think, why did the Muslims decline? How come they were producers of knowledge, leaders of the world for a thousand years? And how come we are at the bottom today? And how can we fix this problem? And now... <clears throat> The vast majority of the Ummah believes today that the cause for our backwardness is that we are behind the West in knowledge. And the West has made amazing strides. And so the solution is simple. We need to acquire Western knowledge. So we need to learn about research, learn robotics, AI, chemistry, biology, physics, mathematics, computer sciences, etc. So this is the diagnosis which is being pursued throughout the Ummah. But there are several problems with this diagnosis. First of all, the West is active and uh, leading the world in the production of this knowledge. And every day they are adding more. And we are far behind and, uh, and uh, moving slowly. So it seems like it will take centuries to catch up to the West. So is it that we can't do anything about this decline for centuries. Uh, there is another problem that Western knowledge says that the West is the most advanced civilization and that the knowledge we have produced is the most important knowledge. Uh, this is uh, in conflict with Islam because Islam teaches us that the Quran is the most important knowledge revealed to mankind. And that the civilization created by the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is the most advanced civilization on the planet. So there is a conflict and a contradiction between saying that the West has superior knowledge or whether the Quran is superior knowledge. So one of the solutions to this problem that has been proposed is the called the Islamization of knowledge. So we take out the problems and the conflicts between Western knowledge and Islam, and we make it uh, Islamic. So we take the poison out, and then we educate the Ummah. But this solution 
which was actually implemented in the International Islamic University, Islamabad and uh, Malaysia, uh, it still faces a problem. Basically, it's still saying that we need Western knowledge to make progress, but Western knowledge is poisonous, so we need to remove the poison. So it still does not say that we need the Quran for guidance today. So <clears throat> this leads us to what we can think of as an impossible dilemma. On the one hand, we can choose to believe that the Quran offers us complete and perfect guidance until the last day. Or we can believe that Western knowledge acquired by Europeans over past three to four centuries is essential for Muslims to make progress today. So these two things are in conflict with each other. It cannot be true that the Quran is complete and perfect if Western knowledge, which is not mentioned at all in the Quran, is essential for us, is most important. So then if West, Western knowledge is essential, then the Quran is not complete guidance because today we need more guidance than is available in the Quran. Now today, most of us believe in both of these things, but belief in one is only a token belief because we, we are, as Muslims, we are committed to the Quran. So we say this as a matter of faith, but when it comes to our intelligence and our actions, uh, we cannot deny uh, item two because Western knowledge is everywhere. It affects us from minute to minute. We have the phones in our pocket and we are communicating and the room we live in and the air conditioning around us, everything in our life is touched and affected by Western knowledge. So it seems impossible to deny the central importance of Western knowledge in our lives today. But if we accept two, that Western knowledge is essential, then we cannot accept one. So this is why this is an impossible dilemma. So, of course, the standard resolution of this conflict is that Islam requires us to pursue knowledge. Allah Ta'ala has many verses in the Quran and many ahadiths which say that we should seek knowledge from our cradle to the grave. So basically, then this says that seeking Western knowledge is part of Islam. And uh, this is, I, I'm going to abandon this. This is the what 99% of the ummah believes. But I'm going to reject this idea. And we pursue the other branch. And we take as axiomatic and given that the Quran is actually complete and perfect. And it's actually sufficient for our guidance today, even though it seems, seems very, almost impossible because it seems that today we need to acquire Western knowledge and without it, we can't make any progress. But let's just accept something which is impossible, which seems impossible. Remember that the prophets were called madmen by their peers. Uh, all of the prophets were told, uh, said that they are magicians or madmen. So when we accept, we say that the Quran is complete and perfect guidance for us today, people will call us madmen because it, it seems mad. So let us try to be mad for a little while. And this is what this lecture is about. So we assume that the Quran is true and we have no doubts about this. The Mu'tazala uh, in the early times <clears throat> said that we use our reason to understand the Quran. Even the Quran, you see, we, we have, when we look at the words of the Quran, what does it mean? We have a, some means of methodology of understanding in our minds. And so our reason is primary. And the Quran is secondary. And so uh, they said that things we learn by reason are just as valid as things we learn from the Quran. But then they use this to argue that Greek philosophy uh, was equivalent to the Quran. And so, but the thing is that everything that the Greek philosophers taught, nearly everything has been proven wrong. So fortunately, Allah Ta'ala uh, 
made the ummah reject the mawzala and so otherwise the mawzala was in a position to contaminate islamic teachings with greek philosophy uh, but today we are faced with the problem of the modern mawzala uh, most muslims believe that western knowledge is like objective facts and reason so we have to accept it and uh, it is on par with the quran it is just as certain just as sure even though actually there are lots of defects and errors in it but just like greek philosophy but today the vast majority of the muslims because they see the power of this knowledge they see it in the mobile in our pocket and they see it all around us so they say it must be true so the fact is that knowledge can be false but it can lead to products which are powerful so today as madmen uh allah taala says do the zikr of allah so much that people call you mad and so today we will take that approach the standard approach is that if we have reason and empirical evidence and this is in conflict with the quran then we should reinterpret the quran to make it conform to our reason but instead what we are going to say is that we will accept the quran and if our reason and empirical evidence is in conflict then we will change our own reasoning and we will reject the empirical evidence so we take the quran as the definition of the truth and we take it as axiomatic everything else can change but the quran cannot be changed so we start from ground zero uh reject our all our past ideas and our past knowledge we start with a blank i know nothing at all and i start with the quran and so the quran starts with um alif lam mim zalik al kitab la rayb fi hudal al muttaqin so this is the surah baqara after surah fatiha and the standard um, explanation of this is that the fatiha is a prayer for guidance in it we ask ehdinas surat al mustaqim and so this all of the quran is the answer to this prayer it it provides the guidance that we have asked for from allah and this is uh, how the surah baqara starts that there is no doubt about this book so we can be sure we can trust what allah taala is telling us and we can be 100% sure there is no doubt in it and what does this book contain it contains guidance but it doesn't contain guidance for everybody it contains that if uh, it contains guidance for those who have taqwa so this is translated as those who have were conscious of allah but we can say those who have perfect and complete belief in allah this is also a possible translation of taqwa so if we believe in allah completely then this book will provide us with complete and perfect guidance so this is where we start from this is our this is we started from zero we know nothing and now this is the first thing that god has told us that you can trust me i will give you guidance provided that you have faith in me so allah taala in the quran in various places says that this book has a clear explanation of everything it has a guidance and it has good news for those who submit and surrender so again allah taala is putting a condition here that if we want guidance we have to submit to allah and then another shall i seek a judge other than allah it is he who has revealed to us this book which is fully detailed again this is a little bit of a surprise allah taala is saying that he has given every detail and uh, then again he says that allah taala has perfected this deen for us and he has completed his favor and he has chosen islam so if you look at it allah taala has given us complete and perfect guidance everything that we need we don't need anything else in particular we don't need western knowledge so this is very strange so 
uh, very strange because it conflicts with what our eyes show us and what our logic tells us. So today we will reject what our eyes show us, which show us the power of the West and the glory of the knowledge created by the West. And uh, we will reject our logic, which says that if we want to uh, progress, we need to acquire technology uh, and science and, and other things. Say that we will ask for guidance only from Allah. So again, we come back to the central question which we, of this talk. So does the Quran offer complete guidance? Allah Ta'ala just uh, said in these ayat that it does offer complete guidance, but it seems to us that we need a lot of knowledge which are of Western sciences, which are not mentioned in the Quran. Even more interesting, Allah Ta'ala is asked about the moon in the Quran and Allah Ta'ala could have explained that this is, comes from the shadow of the earth falling upon it. It's, it's not very difficult to say, but he doesn't say that. Allah Ta'ala sidesteps this question. He doesn't give the scientific answer. He gives an uh, answer that it is good for uh, the determination of the times and so on. Uh, some other benefits of the creation of Allah, but it does not provide the scientific solution. But forget about science. The Quran doesn't even give us detailed instructions about how to make Salat. If you search the Quran, you can get, get a clear answer to how many prayers there are. Uh, we know that there are five prayers that are first. And uh, we cannot discover the time for Zuhar and Asr from the Quran. So, what does this mean? It means that since we are taking the Quran as, as the standard, that what Allah Ta'ala means by complete guidance is very different from what I and you think complete guidance means. We think, you and I, that complete guidance means the Quran should tell us everything we need to do. So now I need to go here, then I need to go there. This is what I need to do. I need to be studying biology today and I need to study chemistry tomorrow. Everything, step by step. This is what we think. But um, there's complete guidance. If the Quran doesn't tell us about what we need to do, then we think it's not complete. But the Quran says it is complete, but it doesn't tell us how to make Salat, at what time to make Salat. So what Allah Ta'ala means by complete guidance is something different. So we need to ask, what does Allah Ta'ala mean by this guidance? So these are not step-by-step -step instructions on how to achieve success. Not even in this world and not even in the Akhirah. We are not given step-by-step -step instructions. Not even for success of the Akhirah. But Allah Ta'ala says that guidance is complete. And he also says that it is detailed. So these words are being used in the Quran. But the sense of these words is not the sense that we are used to. So what we need to do, we abandon what we think these words mean and we try to learn what Allah Ta'ala means by these words. I will take a second to plug in my laptop. All right, so um, All right, so what does Allah Ta'ala mean by guidance? We have to re reconfigure our understandings. So basically, we can think of it, this is a temporary definition. Later, we'll get a more, uh, a clearer answer. But we can think of guidance is that telling us what is the goal? Where do we need to go? Not step-by-step -step details for the journey. So for example, when you go for Hajj, 
we are told that we must get to Arafat on 9th Zul Hajjah. But we are not given step by step instructions on how to get there. Uh, because you see, there are 7 billion people on this planet. Every one of them would need different instructions. So if somebody is in Pakistan, how to get there is step by step is different. And somebody is in America, somebody is in Malaysia, they all have different instructions. And then, of course, these instructions vary uh, if it's in the uh, 19th century, if it's in the 18th century, the timing is different. Sometimes you must use camels, sometimes you can go by ship, etc. So anyway, <clears throat> if Allah Ta'ala wanted to, he, he could give us all. These could be built into our biology. So Allah Ta'ala is all powerful. He could have given us this, but he did not. And so the guidance, so one thing we understand is that step-by-step -step instructions are not part of complete guidance. Uh, what is guidance is to know what the goal is. Uh, but it is left up to us to find the path to this goal. This is very important to understand because this is the critical step. Uh, goal is told to us. How to get to the goal is left up to us. And Allah Ta'ala clarifies this in this ayat. Jahadu fina <clears throat> so when we start to try to achieve the goal, then the process of struggle, the knowledge will be generated. So this knowledge is what we call experiential knowledge. It comes from making the struggle. So experiential knowledge, you see, if you want to learn how to swim, I cannot write down that, okay, touch your hand like this and move the legs like this. When you jump into the water, then you will understand what is needed. <clears throat> Similarly, see if you are um, somebody is teaching us Kung Fu Karate. So he will teach us some maneuvers, but uh, and he might give us a very excellent and expert training. But when you get go into the ring with another fighter, you will not have step by step instruction that he will do this, then you have got to do that. No, you have a training and then you use that training to handle the situation. So the Quran gives us complete and perfect guidance in how we need to struggle in a way that will generate guidance. That is, when we are making the struggle, then the knowledge will be given to us of what we need to do. If we don't struggle, we say, oh, Allah, tell me what to do, but we don't move our hands, then we will not be told what to do. Because Allah Ta has told us in rough details what we need to do. So if we start doing these things, then we will get the knowledge of what additional we need to do. So this actually leads to a radical change in perspective. <clears throat> we have to focus on the struggle, not on the outcome. Uh, we, have to uh, we have to focus on what I need to do now, not on uh, what will happen as a result of this struggle whether I will win or whether I will lose. Winning or losing, the outcome is not the concern of Allah. Allah Ta'ala wants us to be in the battle. And um, not all kinds of methods of struggling are right. In fact, there is a very specialized way in which we have to struggle. So we have to struggle for the cause of Allah. If we struggle for our nafs, if we struggle to make money, if we struggle for other causes, we struggle so that people will call us brave and honorable and courageous. These are all failures. These, these kinds of struggles will not lead to guidance. So in particular, it's very important to understand guidance is not victory and guidance is not more wealth and guidance is not uh, having better technology than others. <clears throat> There's a very interesting prophecy in the Bible about our prophet that I have much more to say to you, Isa alayhi salam says, to his Hawariyin, more than you can bear. So what 
the message is very powerful it is so powerful that they cannot even bear the they don't have but when he the spirit of truth that is the prophet muhammad he will guide us into all truth and he will speak what he has told by allah and he will tell you what is to come so the truth that the prophet muhammad brought to us sallallahu alaihi wasallam is very deep and difficult and radical it is more than most people can bear to hear and this truth was revealed to the ummah by our prophet and this truth is just as powerful just as revolutionary today as it was when it was first revealed so some of the lessons that are critical in understanding this message is that uh the what is the worldly life except the enjoyment of delusion so allah taala says that this life of this world is just a delusion and he <clears throat> says that you prefer the worldly life even though al akhirat khairun wa abqa so he is telling us that this is a silly thing to do world will last for only a moment and the pleasures of this world are are small and the pains of this world are small but the akhira is forever and the pleasures there are far greater than anything that anyone can experience in this world and also the pain there is much much harsher than anything that anyone can have in this world so we need to change our preferences instead of this worldly life we need to worry about the hereafter so in the surah tauba allah taala teaches us that uh, this is a extension of the same message but in greater detail that if you love your parents and children and siblings and spouses and family and wealth and trade and homes and everything of this worldly thing the place that we love if these are more beloved than allah taala and his prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and struggling in his way this is very important the third thing that we must love is the struggle for the deen then allah taala uh, if you if you that these th- three loves have to be prioritized over the love of dunya remember that these are the three questions of the grave if we love these things then we will be uh, able to answer that who is your rabb we will say allah if we love allah above all things and if uh, we are asked who is the messenger we will recognize the prophet if we have struggled for his cause above all other causes and if we have struggled to spread the deen then we will understand what the deen is but if we love our parents and children and siblings and spouses and this is the worldly love which <clears throat> which are built into our hearts then we will be not able to answer these questions similarly allah taala says husila ma fi sudur the allah taala when we die then allah taala will take out what is in our hearts and examine it so this is what will be in our hearts it will be either the love of allah and his messenger or the struggle for the deen or it will be the love of dunya so <clears throat> those who die with the love of allah foremost in their hearts they are the ones who will have success and allah taala tells us that real success is on the day of judgment allah taala has promised the jannah to the believers and allah's pleasure which is far superior to the jannah and that is the supreme success so this is the critical message that success is not getting power in this world this has not getting wealth and pleasure of this dunya success is on the day of judgment so how can we get the supreme success that is guidance and so once we understand what success means then we can understand that the quran offers us complete and perfect guidance on how we can get the supreme success western knowledge offers us ways to get an illusion of success and this illusion is like dust even when you have it it turns to dust in your mouth and in the long run it is just 
meaningless. <clears throat> So the final message of God to mankind is just as revolutionary today as it was 1400 years ago. But now the question is, why does the Ummah fail to recognize this message as being revolutionary? We are, instead of looking to the message for guidance, on what we need to do today, we are looking to the West. And of course, um, we are not implementing the ideas which the Quran tells us that this is what you need to do. Well, first of all, we don't recognize it. But then those who are looking to the Quran are not implementing what the Quran teaches us to do. So why is this, why is this failure? When we have the complete and perfect guidance, then uh, we should not be in this position. So one of the answers is that colonization occurred in the 17th century, uh, 18th century, and uh, at the start, by the start of the 20th century, most of the homelands of the Islamic civilizations were colonized. And now you have to understand that colonization, this is something very important. Colonization is actually conquest of minds. It cannot be, you cannot have a small handful of people who rule hundreds of thousands without conquering their minds. If, uh, if the people don't believe in the power of the West, then the West cannot have power over them because hundreds of thousands of people cannot be governed by a handful of people. So how is this conquest of minds achieved? Is It is achieved by education. Colonization destroyed the indigenous educational systems deliberately. These were capable of producing the thought leaders for a revolution. And it replaced these systems by a Western educational system which was designed to produce admiration and awe of the West and contempt and hatred for Islamic heritage and civilization. So there is a famous Macaulay's Minute on Education, which was enacted in India. And there are two points to note. Macaulay said that a single shelf of a good European library is worth the whole native literature, all of the thousand years of production of knowledge in Islam uh, was just meaningless, just nothing. It is just garbage. Today, what the Western have produced, that is real knowledge, according to Macaulay. And then he said, what is the purpose of education? Purpose of education is to create people who will, who will understand the West and will take Western ideas and give them to the millions who are uh, being governed. A class of people who are Indian in blood and color but English in tastes and in opinions and in morals and in intellect. So this is the purpose of education. And today the purpose of Western education remains exactly the same. It produces people who have English tastes, Western tastes, Western opinions, Western intellect, and they th see of their job as being to convey these benefits of uh, Western education to those people who are ignorant and superstitious in the, the millions of the Ummah. So they think that the Western knowledge is powerful and the reason for the failure of the Ummah today is because they don't have it. And so they see their job as to educate the ignorant people who are just studying the Quran in their madrasas and have no real knowledge. So when we go through Western education, we are trained to believe that Western civilization is the most advanced civilization on the planet. The knowledge produced by the West is the most valuable knowledge produced by mankind. And our own intellectual heritage is of zero value in the modern world. And also the Quran does not provide us with guidance for our modern world. Because we study for four years, no mention of the Quran. So the West tells us that all the problems we are facing today, the solutions lie in the Western intellectual heritage. 
So to counter this toxic effect, this poison which Western education puts into our minds, we have the Ghazali project. Uh, this requires three steps. We must strengthen our faith, remove doubts about Islam, remove doubts about the Quran. And the second step is the Hafatul philosopher, which is to understand that Western wisdom is really very foolish. There are many, many fundamental flaws and errors in the structure of knowledge created by the West. And once we understand that Western knowledge is flawed, uh, we don't need to Islamize it. We can just throw it away. Then we need to rebuild the stock of human knowledge on Islamic foundations. We have to start from zero, start from the foundations of the Quran, and then rebuild the entire stock of knowledge. So there are two aspects of this project. One is the individual level, creating, understanding a revolution within our own selves, inside my uh, spirit and heart and mind. And the second level is institutional, to create this change on a mass level throughout the Islamic world. <clears throat> so this talk is at the individual level. It is addressed to my audience, individuals. But we have, we are working in parallel on creating textbooks and on inviting teachers to participate in this project and to start replacing Western course courses by uh, Islamic courses. And uh, to understand that economics is really a religion. It is not a science. This religion is necessary to sustain the capitalist economic system and it is currently being taught throughout the world to Muslims. And we need to replace this at the institutional level. And we are doing various uh, projects to try to do this. And those teachers who are um, interested in participating should contact me. <clears throat> so we come back again to the central question. Does the Quran offer us complete and perfect guidance for today, not for last century, for our modern lives? Yes, it tells us how we can lead our modern lives so that we can get the supreme success. Uh, this is not, doesn't really make us very happy because we say that, okay, maybe if we live a miserable life in this world today, we can be very happy in the Akhara, but I don't have the strength, I don't have the energy, I don't have the power to just go in a jungle and seclude myself and make Salat and uh, just lead this life with nothing and then uh, have success on the day of the Akhara. So we, we want something which will actually help us today in our modern lives. So we can ask, will the Quran help us in our current daily lives on an individual basis? And can it, can it help us at the group level? Can it help our families and our communities and our nations and can we improve the condition of the Ummah without focusing on Western education? So the answer to all of these questions is also yes, even though it seems like it might be no. So uh, this part is a little bit difficult and I have addressed it in detail in many other lectures. So I'm not going to go through this in detail, but the critical, the central, the foundation of Western knowledge is their epistemology. It says that knowledge comes from observations and evidence. That is what uh, a university education teaches us to believe. Empirical evidence and logic, reason, rationality. But Allah Ta'ala tells us that guidance is for those who believe in the unseen. So right away we have a problem in epistemology. The Quran teaches us that we have to believe in the unseen. We have to believe in God. We have to believe in the revelation. <laughs> but the West tells us that, no, don't believe in anything which you cannot see. So the West, because they rejected uh, the intuition and the heart, so they rejected uh, the knowledge which is in the hearts. But Allah tells us that the most important knowledge is that in our hearts. And so um, 
There is this ayat in the Quran which tells us that all of this was created before the creation and we were given consciousness and reasoning abilities that we would have later. And Allah Ta'ala asked us, am I not your Rabb? And we said that, yes, of course. Balash hidna. So what does this mean? Uh, one person, I said, he said that, no, I don't remember this, so it doesn't apply to me. So the thing is that this oath is not inside our head. It is printed on our hearts. That is why our hearts recognize God. And this is true for every human being, whether they are atheist or whether they are Christian. They all have this oath printed in their hearts. So we know of so many stories where in their moment of distress, atheists call out to God for help. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ told us also that the heart is a very important part of our body. And so Quran tells us that it is not the eyes that are blind, but the hearts that are blind. So the entire stock of Western knowledge has been built by people who have blind hearts. And this is why it is so deadly. That's why we need to rebuild this entire stock, but on the Quranic foundations. Faith is really a noor in the heart. It does not come from logic and arguments. And the, those people who have blind hearts, they are making today the most ridiculous arguments for atheism. They say that we can prove that God doesn't exist. But <clears throat> they agree that the universe is created. They agree that there is a Big Bang. So there was a time when the universe was not. And then it came to be. So that leads to the obvious question. How was it created? Who created the universe? They have no answers to this. And they cannot have answers to this because it is there is no empirical evidence possible. According to the laws of phys physics, we cannot observe something which is outside our universe. So obviously, whoever was the creator, however it was created, this was outside the universe because it was happened before the universe existed. So according to the Western epistemology itself, the West cannot have any knowledge about the creator. So to say that there is no creator is ridiculous. It's illogical. Because we, all they can say is we don't know. So all of this so far we have not discussed what the message of the, what is the guidance. We have just discussed why we Muslims are not looking at the guidance. We, are, we don't trust the message. We don't use the message. Instead, today, whenever we have a problem, economic problem, we ask the Harvard experts. And so the problem why we are not looking at the uh, at the Quran for guidance is the Western education, which teaches us uh, the the it has toxic hidden messages. It says there is no God, there is no life after death, there is no judgment. Man is just a type of animal. The goal of life is pursuit of pleasure and power, and the morality is just the survival of the fittest. And all of this is packed into the word rationality, because it is rational to believe in the unseen. And everything that um, uh, everything else follows from this idea of rationality, which does not agree with what we Muslims call rationality. So <clears throat> now I'm going to <clears throat> stop the critique of the West. This is my my writings are full of that. And instead, I'm going to ask, what are the critical elements of the message? What is the complete and perfect guidance from God? <clears throat> so. The first thing is that uh, in the first step in the Ghazali project is to build our trust in God. We have to trust that God can lead us out of our darkness, not Western knowledge can lead us out of darkness. And so this requires connecting our hearts to God. And so this can be done by <clears throat> making dua from the heart. Also, if we get up in the nights in the darkness and talk to Allah Ta'ala, when everything is silent, and there's nothing, no distraction. This is a powerful way to build our connection to Allah. And of course, going out in the path of Allah, which I did in Tabliq, it is a practical method for struggling in the cause of Allah. 
And if we struggle in the cause of Allah, Allah Ta'ala will uh, guide us to his pathways. There are also some conversion stories which touch our hearts and are powerful. So I have <clears throat> given a link to one of them that I thought was very impressive. <clears throat> so uh, one way to the second step was to reject Western fallacies. And one way to do that is to just compare, match what our philosophers have said and what the West has said. And there are many places where there are contradictions. And today, unfortunately, <clears throat> what we are doing is <clears throat> when we see Western philosophers say something, we say, oh, that is right. And uh, our own tradition is wrong. We have to go the opposite way. If we see a contradiction between the Quran and the, uh, and the uh, West, we assert Quran is true and we say that the West is wrong. And once you start doing this, then it is easy to see where the West has gone wrong. They're, they have made some really fundamental errors. Uh, so I have made a, a big list of this elsewhere, but here let me just mention that the concept of probability is tied to the ghaib. It relates to what might have happened. But what might have happened cannot be seen. So when the West rejected God, they also rejected everything that cannot be seen. And so they also rejected probability. And so the standard definition of probability in the textbooks is the frequency theory, which says you just flip the coin over and over again. That's not probability because probability refers to just one flip. But why the West rejected this one flip idea that, okay, it came up heads, but it could have come up tails. They rejected this because it refers to the unseen. So I'm just saying this as one simple, trivial example that even very, very basic concepts cannot be understood by the West because of their wrong epistemology. But today, the problem with the Muslims is that we don't have confidence and trust in our message. So we're not able to say, yes, everybody has been saying this for 100 years, but they're all wrong because we don't have the confidence in our God and our message. <clears throat> So we need to rebuild <clears throat> human knowledge. And uh, this has to be done at three levels for us as individuals, collectively in our communities, in our families, in our neighborhoods. And institutionally, we have to, and, and that's the critical focus of the Ghazali project, that we need to change the courses which are being taught in the university. And the eventual is goal to, is to replace the entire Western syllabus by courses built on Islamic foundations. And then also the methodology of teaching, classes, grading, degrees, replace this by Islamic methodology. But this, this has to be done in steps and we are starting to take the first steps. So <clears throat> we will, uh, I'm coming to the end of this lecture and we are going to go some uh, revolutionary insights from the guidance. And one of them is the Allah Ta'ala is all powerful. He gives honor to those he wants and he takes away the honor. And all good belongs only to Allah and he is all powerful. So <clears throat> all the others <clears throat> that we think are powerful, if we think that the USA has power to harm us, if we think the atom bombs have power, they don't have any power. Not even more, Allah Ta'ala says, they don't have power like the skin of a date seed. So <clears throat> critical to understand that all benefits to us can come only from Allah and all harm can only come only from Allah. So the practical implication of this is that <clears throat> when the Prophet ﷺ was sleeping, and he had hung up his sword. One kafir came up and he took the sword and he said to the prophet, who can save you from me? So the prophet saved, uh, looked, woke up from his sleep and he said, Allah. So, you see, the thing to do is to imagine this situation. That if somebody is holding a sword and he is threatening to kill you, then the faith that Allah Ta'ala is all-powerful 
means that you must believe that this sword has no power to hurt you. It is only the power belongs only to Allah. So if it is the will of Allah, then Allah, this sword will hurt you. So once you understand this, that and, and this is easy to say with the mouth, but easy to uh, believe with the heart. If your heart is pounding that maybe this man will harm me, then you have not understood la ilaha illallah. Because harm is not in the sword. It is in the will of Allah only. If, once we understand this, then only one thing matters. Since Allah Ta'ala is all-powerful, nothing can help, nothing can hurt. So only the one thing matters is how to build our relationship with Allah. So guidance is what we need to do to earn the pleasure of Allah. And now we, when we understand this, then we understand that the Quran provides complete and perfect guidance. How do we build our relationship with Allah? This is the only thing we need to do. And in once we understand this, then we understand that the Quran provides complete and perfect guidance. All of the Western knowledge that we think is very powerful is just a distraction. It uh, creates doubt in our faith and in our trust in Allah. So again, <clears throat> the question arises. The shaitan comes in and was was. He tells us, is this really all? Don't we need to worry about our worldly affairs? Separately from our connection with Allah. <clears throat> so, um, actually, in many different places, Allah Ta'ala says that if you worry about me, I will take worry about everything else. So, specifically, there is a saying that in the ahadith that if I worry about Allah, Allah Ta'ala will take care of all my other concerns. And in the Quran, it says that. We have only responsibility for ourselves. If we, <clears throat> do, if we follow the guidance, then nobody else can cause us any harm. So basically, we have to worry about our good deeds. So some events which uh, are mentioned, which explain this further, is the Hunain, where the Muslims were large in number for the first time and facing an enemy which was smaller. So instead of trusting in Allah, some people said that now we will win because we have more in numbers. So Allah Ta'ala caused the defeat of the Muslims and most of them went back and then a small number remained with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he called to them and then Allah Ta'ala gave victory to the small number to show that we must trust in Allah alone not in our numbers and not in material causes. Remember Musa alayhi salam and the Yahudis were slaves. And Allah Ta'ala did not um, tell them that you need to acquire material power. He said that you build your connection to Allah. And when they had done so, then Musa alayhi salam was given the order. Now they have done what they were needed. They have done istighfar. And now you lead them out. And Allah Ta'ala drowned the armies of the Fir'aun. <coughs> the Ashab al mentioned in the Quran, they were all burned to death. They did not achieve worldly success, but they are supremely successful in the Akhirah. In Afghanistan, we have the example of the world's greatest power spent trillions of dollars in 20 years, but a small handful of ragged people with practically nothing they were given the success and the victory for Allah. So there is only one thing which matters. Learning how to build our connection with Allah. And that requires good deeds. So this is true at the individual level and the collective level. If we ask how can the Muslim Ummah progress. People say oh we need to build schools. We need to build uh, um, organization etc. 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 Many technology, science. Uh, do this, that and the other. There is only one thing which matters between one <clears throat> between today and tomorrow. Allah Ta'ala is looking at how many good deeds are being done in the Ummah. <laughs> so if the Ummah made more good deeds today, we are getting closer to Allah and we have succeeded today. If the number of deeds is less, if the number of good deeds is less or they are less valuable in the eyes of Allah, then we have slid backwards. Now the good deeds that we do 
do not depend on whether we have money or power, technology, whether we are slaves or whether we are kings. It depends on our recognizing what Allah Ta'ala wants us to do and then doing it. So uh, this is almost the last slide. So we have to switch to process thinking. This is very different from outcome thinking, which we have been taught to do in the West. Are we going to succeed when we launch a revolution? Will this succeed? No. Right now, am I doing what Allah Ta'ala wants me to do? <clears throat> if so, I have achieved the supreme success at this moment. It doesn't matter what happens next. Uh, so everyone can achieve complete success at every moment by paying attention to what Allah Ta'ala wants and then doing it. It doesn't matter whether we become shaheed or whether we become baghazi or whether our projects succeed <clears throat> in worldly sense or whether we are all killed uh, by thro being thrown in the fire. So this is a very different way of thinking from what the West teaches us. <clears throat> but this is the way that this is the revolutionary message of the Quran. So we can conclude this lecture by Subhanakallahumma bihamdika shadun la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka tubu alayk subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun al mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen and so that is the end of this lecture and we will open this for All right, so <clears throat> now um, we can open this for uh, comments and questions. So I see that Fawad Masood has hang, uh, has hand up. So let me ask him to unmute and ask the question. Yes, Fawad, can you? Ask a question. I see a comment saying Western knowledge is wrong. Uh, this is a little bit more uh, complicated, complicated than that. Western knowledge is built on the wrong foundations and used for the wrong purposes. It is used to acquire power and pleasure. And, uh, so, and it is used for the wrong purposes. Uh, so that is why uh, we need to uh, rebuild this knowledge. So I cannot get Fawad to unmute. So let me ask Ambreen Sultan. Yes. Assalamualaikum, <clears throat> sir. Um, I congratulate you for performing Hajj. And secondly, uh, my question is related to um, there are two approaches that are usually mentioned. Um, uh, that is a modification approach or non-modification approach to Islamize the knowledge. So in the modification approach, you just take the Western knowledge and modify it. Um, but even in that, now Islamization knowledge is criticized heavily. So there is integration of knowledge. And integration of knowledge, uh, um, when I attended a couple of uh, lectures, I, um, I get to know that it is at two level, horizontal and vertical integration. One is like um, integrating the worldview of Islam uh, to the human acquired knowledge and also integration of um, interdisciplinary knowledge, like economics cannot be studied in isolation. It should be integrated with other subjects. So I see that this uh, integration of knowledge has more uh, value and it's not um, marginalizing the Islamic knowledge and um, starting the Western knowledge as a point uh, of reference and then Islamizing it. And second, uh, the modification approach, uh, uh, non-modification approach says that you uh, rely on uh, completely um, uh, on the uh, Quran and Sunnah guidance. And then um, do you agree that we have multiple level of uh, existence? So at, no, at material level, we will be uh, relying on sense perception and then um, uh, maratibal loom and maratibal, like there are multiple level of existence, multiple level of uh, epistemology corresponding to each other. So if I see from this perspective, uh, if Muslims make progress in the um, material level, then 
isn't it we will also come up with the, the same western knowledge but it is with based with ethical values uh, like all the development that take place uh, uh, isn't it that muslims are left behind they didn't do anything otherwise if they would be progressing and if islamic um, uh, like uh, uh, the, the the rich heritage of knowledge development was not uh, stagnant for a long period of time we would also be come up with throughout the islamic uh, history there were civilization who thrived who uh, progressed in terms of uh, so many things so i'm this is a confusion that i see uh, for example if we neglect uh, all the western knowledge then today the technological um, um, advancement that is allowing us to communicate with each other that would not be possible so i have got uh, your question now what you are referring to is the approach of Rajiv Shantar, which is quite correct, and I have referred to it. And in fact, on my website, there is a sequence of lectures on decolonization of the social sciences. And um, what I am saying, <clears throat> when I say reject knowledge, I am saying that the modern Western knowledge is built on the wrong foundations. It is built on ontological and epistemological assumptions which are in conflict with the Quran. So what we need to do is knock it all down, start all over again, build on the foundations of the Quran. And when we rebuild, we will uh, come up with the same things for the most part, not everywhere. At the moment, because Muslims are overly impressed with the West, they accept as true many things which are not actually true because the West believes them to true. For example, the law of gravity. Everybody believes this is true, but actually even in the West, and actually in the West, they moved beyond that. So one of the critical things that <coughs> has occurred in um, development in philosophy of science is that science cannot lead you to truth. <laughs> this is the basic uh, understanding of the Kuhnian scientific revolutions, that at all times, all theories are just hypotheses about what might be happening. And we know that all of these hypotheses are wrong because they all omit the role of the creator of the universe. In fact, there is a famous uh, French astronomer who presented his books, mathematician, um, what is his name? I very famous, I've forgotten the name right now. Uh, but anyway, he presented his book on astronomy, on the planets, on the movement of the planets to Napoleon. And Napoleon said, Monsieur, in this book, you have not mentioned, uh, made any mention of God. So he said, sir, I have no need of that hypothesis. So this is the thing that when you are building a stock of knowledge, which makes no mention of God, then it is wrong. So now you have to start from the foundations of the Quran and then anything that the West has learned that is useful, we will rebuild that, we will relearn that, we will reacquire that and we will make use of that, but on the foundations of the Quran. So uh, this is not saying we reject Western knowledge, take the mobile out of your pocket and throw it away because it's a product of the West. This is, my position is more, um, sophisticated and complex, it has to do with the knowledge base that is being taught when we are taught chemistry in, uh, in um, our university courses, no mention is made of God. So this is wrong because the, uh, the pattern and the motion of the molecules is something which has created, been created by Allah and the beautiful symmetry and the laws which are uh, satisfied. These are all creations of Allah. So unless we Say Subhana Tabarak Allah Asanul Khaliqeen. We are not studying this correct. All right, so let me go on to. So uh, there are many different ways to express this insight, but the problem is that um, because we are overly, it is better to think of because we are overly impressed, because we have colonized minds. Uh, it is dangerous to say, okay, let's take the Western knowledge and Islamize it because we, what happens in practice, as I have seen, 
is that people accept too much of it uncritically. So it's better to say, okay, throw everything out, start building from zero, and once build on Islamic foundations, and then examine if you find a piece of Western knowledge which fits, you can accept it. There is no harm. The Islam allows us to take knowledge from other civilizations. But if we take, uh, if we build on foundations of Samuelson, we will surely go astray. All right. So let me see if Fuad Masood can come back and unmute himself. Hello? Yes. Hello. Okay. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam. Wa alaikum as salam. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, in your uh, PowerPoint, uh, you just wrote about uh, the uh, central concept of statistic and econometric probability and causality. It's strong uh, so in your opinion, yeah, in your PowerPoint, rejecting Western policies. Yeah? And I think uh, we need uh, more discussion um, uh, in this uh, subject because as a social scientist uh, who learn uh, economics and also organization, uh, I think it, it's uh, difficult to reject uh, causality and probability in economics. So I think uh, next, uh, the future, um, I mean, next meeting, we should uh, discuss this in all, uh, in one session or two session, yeah, because I think it's important. How to reject the causality and probability in economics. Yes, I think uh, in my lectures, I've, I've said in other lectures that social science is a religion. It is not a science. So all of that has to be changed as well as all of statistics and econometrics. So basically, once we start doubting what the West teaches us, we find that a lot of it, which we accept without uh, question, is just wrong. That's why we need to rebuild from zero. All right. I think let me go to Vaseem Arshad. Ah, oh, yes, Vaseem Arshad, can you unmute? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Sir, congratulations to you for performing the Hajj. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank welcome. you very much for uh, giving such a fruitful lecture. Uh, my question to you is that if you look at the Holy Quran, uh, it is interesting, uh, instructed to the Muslim, Laqad kana lakum fi rasulillahi uswatun hasana. Uh, you have to follow the path of the Holy Prophet. But if, if, you, if you look deeply, the seerah of the Holy Prophet, the Holy Prophet changed all the society by changing, uh, by attaining the power from the, uh, from the Arabs, those who were uh, capturing all the system of economics as well as politics as well as the system of the society the holy prophet changed it all at all and then implemented all what you are saying so don't you think that it would be the right step to just uh, effort to establish a deen in other technical word we call it khilafa establish the the world of khilafa and then we will do all that that we want to do because when we when we have political power, it would be very easy for us to implement what we want to see and what we want to think that this is actually the right. Well, you see, as I said in this lecture, the critical question is how to connect my heart to Allah. And for that, I don't need political power. And actually, <clears throat> using political power, you cannot connect the heart of anybody to Allah. You can, you can force them to make salat but you cannot change their hearts. So political power is irrelevant to our uh, uh, essential central concerns. <clears throat> if our hearts are connected to Allah, Allah Ta'ala will give us all that we need. If, the, if we need political power, he will give it to us. If we don't need it, he will not. I mean, it's, it's up to Allah. All we need is to build our relationship to Allah and everything else all our other concerns, he will take care of it. So, next I see um, Osama Wakil. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Sahib. Wa alaikum assalam. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. 
Jazakallah. Sir, what's your opinion on the Western knowledge that is built on the foundational work made by the Muslim scholars? And one more opinion on... Give yeah, an example of that. Quote in Urdu. Yeah, in Urdu. That no one or no one has the right to the Muslim or no one has the right to the जहाँ से भी पाए उसको हासिल कर ले तो इसके ऊपर आप आई आई ऑलरेडी कोटेड दैट हदीस इन द लास्ट पार्ट ऑफ माय लेक्चर एंड द प्रॉब्लम दैट एग्जिस्ट इज दैट सोशल साइंस इज अ रिलिजन इट इज नॉट अ दीन इट इज नॉट अ साइंस एंड दिस इज द डिसेप्शन ऑफ वेस्टर्न नॉलेज सो सोशल साइंस इज जस्ट लाइक सेइंग क्रिश्चियनिटी यू सी विद इन क्रिश्चियनिटी देयर लॉट्स ऑफ गुड थिंग्स बट because it comes from the right origins but we reject christianity completely because it's the foundation of christianity is the belief that isa alaihi salam is god so everything else just uh, yani even if they say good things we cannot accept them because the foundation is wrong and uh, even though we have a lot of things in common with christianity because christianity is after all comes from a revealed religion it is a distortion so this just like this the western knowledge is the deen of the west and we cannot accept their deen because it's built on the wrong foundations even though there are useful things within that and there are things which match so when we say knowledge knowledge means knowledge that is fine but uh, what is being taught in the western um, university is a religion and that religion we cannot accept all right so nighat assalam yes. alaikum uh, professor can you hear me yes wa alaikum assalam yeah, i can hear you Prof, I have uh, just a comment, or you may take it as a question. That uh, don't you think that there should be uh, maybe a group of people, or many people like you, uh, maybe in the field of mathematics and physics, to think like this way that we have to sort of rebuild this, the basis of mathematics, because whenever these days we uh, learn about finance or the other subjects. we saw the basic theories of whatever i mean the west is teaching us so uh, even if uh, i mean whatever you are uh, I mean uh, telling us or sharing us so uh, do you think other people in the field of mathematics or physics they are also aware of the importance of that or agreeing with your idea because one day we have to restart this thing and uh, just like the west they have built their education or their uh, system uh, over the period of time so it may take uh, the muslims to i mean build maybe it may, it may take several uh, sort of decades so uh, uh, we at this stage maybe uh, i'm uh, maybe those who have already crossed 40 or 50 what how should they they sort of i mean think because it is a time sort of consuming thing and uh, i think the what you have mentioned about faith the most powerful sort of uh, the the capturing the mind somebody's mind i mean it's the faith whether somebody is educated or not educated from that perspective if we if we trust or faith in allah obviously we will be very very close to him and we will seek his hidaya so my my question is uh, uh, at the ground reality other people in other fields are they with you are there some sort of forums where people are exploring this idea thank you and thank you bearing with me for this long question okay so uh, i have a lot of students all over the world and i am working with them to introduce my ideas into universities as far as mathematics is concerned yes western mathematics which i study i took my bachelor's in mathematics from mit it's terrible yani what they teach in mathematics is uh, highly inefficient highly uh, useless there are ways to teach much better much more efficiently much more powerful mathematics today and people are working on them Uh, there are people who are working on these methods but uh, yes the problem is that as you said about decades this is looking at the outcomes all we need to do 
is to make sure that at this moment i do what is needed for now and that is success uh, there as a hadith that it says if qiyamah is coming and you see the signs and you are planting a plant seed go ahead and plant it <clears throat> so you don't <clears throat> when you are planting the seed you are uh, the object of the planting of the seed is that the plant will grow into a tree and will bear fruit or will produce flowers but the qiyamah is already coming so this will never happen but we are uh, doing the planting because it is the order of allah because we think that this will make allah taala happy so we do it we don't look at the outcome so what will happen in one decade or two decade is no concern of ours that is what uh, allah taala will do what is the concern of ours is that right now at this minute i do what allah taala wants me to do okay so hasan ghaffar or hasan yes hasan or is it hasan assalam alaikum wa alaikum assalam Uh, so um, my name my name is Hassan. Yes. And and my question is, uh, as you know, many Islamic institutes in Pakistan and, and all over the world, they are actually taking interest in uh, robotics, AI. So do do you think that uh, that is because of the colonized mind, or the Muslims uh, uh, institutes and students take interest in technological changes and developments? Okay. So. artificial intelligence there is all the rage and there is a lot of hype about it and there are lots of real things it can do and there are also lots of real things that it cannot do it cannot ever do them unfortunately uh, the distinction between what can be done and what cannot be done is uh, absent from the minds of most people they don't know the difference and because of this it's very dangerous because people can uh if you understand the limitations then you can do it for you can use it for things for which it is useful but you should not use it for what it is not useful but people think for example that it could give us fatwa but it cannot give us fatwa why now that is important to understand because fatwa depend on human beings ab- abilities their sensibilities and uh, this is something which yani the um, the ai knows words which have been used but it does not know the feelings uh, behind the words so it cannot interpret them properly anyway this is a complex subject and uh, the problem is again uh, colonization of minds uh, we are overly impressed so we accept a lot of things on face value instead of being able to question and uh, to criticize and to understand that this is a powerful tool but it has its limitations what are the limitations if you understand the tool and its limitations then you can use it correctly if you don't understand it then you will use it in the wrong places and you will uh, generate huge problems and errors uh, without being aware of this So I think this is three uh, thirty. So we should stop. I see one more question. So let that be the last one. Dr. Sheikh. Wa alaikum Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam. Firstly, I want to begin by saying a heartiest Hajj Mabrook to you. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala accept exactly. your struggles that went into his path. I mean. Uh, so my question relates to when you mentioned about uh, uh, production of knowledge. When you said, uh, like, when knowledge is produced, from my limited understanding and uh, reading around this subject, um, as I understand it, humans cannot really produce knowledge. Can we produce knowledge? I as i as i as i conceptualize it knowledge already exists no, knowledge is existent we might not be aware of it due to our limited intellectual abilities but it is existent 
what we as humans can do is just strive in order to be granted that knowledge and uh, unveil, so to speak, that ilm that already exists in the alam. Uh, ilm exists isn't... only in the mind of God. And he gives it to whomever he wants. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum la ta'khazuhu sinatan wa la na'um lahu ma fi al-samawati wa ma fi al-ard man zal ladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi iznihi ya'lamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma khalfahum wa la yuhituna bi shay'in min 'ilmihi illa bi ma sha'a so Allah Ta'ala has all knowledge of everything which in the past and in the future and he gives that knowledge to whomsoever he pleases so when we build our connection with Allah Allah Ta'ala will give us the knowledge that we need. It is impossible for us to get all knowledge because it's not within human capabilities. So we will get a limited and temporary and small amount of knowledge that we need for our purposes. So I think I will stop here and uh, our next uh, session will be one month from now on the last Sunday uh, inshallah. On Again, this was a topic which was not directly related to economics. Next time we will talk more about money and its role and value. And uh, also we will discuss, um, well, not, not in the lecture, but how we can move on this project of replacing economics in the Islamic world by Islamic economics by courses, so changing the courses because the course of economics as it currently is teaches people that the goal of life is the pursuit of pleasure. And this is very toxic message and very much in conflict with Islam. So that is all for today. Subhanallah bihamdihi subhanallah ila zeen. Tabarakallah ahsan al khaliqeen. Okay, we can end the recording now.